All right, thanks, uh, Alfonso. Um, and thank you, Liz, for organizing so much of this week and for helping me with a practice uh, run of this. Um, and hey, everyone, thank you for coming to my talk today. Um, my name is Julius Zurich. I am a uh, former student of Launch School, but still very active in the community, as I try to be. And um, I wanted to spend some time today talking about a topic um, on uh, building tacit knowledge in software development. This is a topic that is, I feel a little more forward looking in terms of um, your career as a software developer. There's certainly a lot that's applicable to your studies if you're going through the core, but also um, applicable to when you start your career um, after lunch school and move into your next uh, job. And um, we're gonna kick it off right now. So, me, okay. So before we dive into the topic, I wanted to give a bit of a background on myself so you can get to know me better um, and see kind of where I'm coming from with this presentation. Um, before launch school, so this was basically around uh, 2015, 2016, um, I was a recent graduate from college and I had a bachelor's degree in physics. Um, but unfortunately, due to uh, my experiences in my degree program and uh, the little bit of research that I got involved in, my plans to go to graduate school uh, for physics just were not what I wanted to do anymore. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of students in our school can relate to having your plans or your career aspirations change um, and kind of being the impetus to what leads us to launch school. Um, so I finished my degree and I actually ended up somehow landing a job at a startup, um, a healthcare uh, software startup. Um, but I wasn't doing anything technical at the time. I was actually working as a client manager, um, which is a pretty interesting uh, change of pace. Um, the, the reasoning for this uh, beginning job was because while I had some technical chops from my physics degree, there wasn't anything specific to coding or software um, at all that I had in my experience. So they couldn't put me in anything technical, but um, I had done quite a few things in college that uh, worked on my communication skills and that seemed to impress. And so that that's how I ended up in my position as a client manager. And I worked at that startup for about in a year and a half. Um, and over that year and a half, I found that I was very unhappy with my position and also what my ultimate career would be. Um, I was kind of like looking down the next five or 10 years of my life and seeing whether I wanted to still be this company or be a client manager and go down this career. And I realized that I was not um, looking forward to that. And I felt like I needed a change. The one good thing from this experience was that I got to meet a lot of engineers at the startup and they encouraged me to try and get into, uh, into the industry of software development um, because it's something you didn't have to go back to college for. And after looking around for a while and actually going through a boot camp that didn't work out, I found Launch School. And so in early 2017, I started the Launch School Core and I actually quit my job and worked full time. Um, just day in and day out was spent on Launch School. Um, and by the end of 2018, I actually finished Core and started Capstone. And I did Capstone in the winter of uh, 2018 and I finished in early 2019 and decided to move to New York City to go look for a new job. And after several months of job hunting, I ended up at DigitalOcean, which is where I still work today. And in DigitalOcean, the areas of software that I work in are kind of removed from what we learned at launch school. Uh, most of the work I do is in cloud computing, computer networking, microservices, and distributed systems. So outside of computer networking, there's not a lot in what I do now that is something I directly learned from launch school. I was able to get this job and start working in these areas because of the foundations launch school and Capstone gave me. And today's talk is really a reflection from two years at my job working as a professional developer and kind of reflecting on those years and how the things I learned then could apply to launch school. And so the inspiration for this talk were, is really based on the changes that I experienced in my life and um, what I was learning from leaving launch school and going on to DigitalOcean. Um, looking back, 
I think that my experience at launch school, which is similar to a lot of other students, can be summarized as that you're spending a lot of time studying with peers at the same skill level as you. Um, there are a number of students who have some experience in technology or programming before launch school. Um, but from what I've noticed and observed, a lot of students typically don't have a lot of experience and they're coming in and they're all kind of starting near the same level. And so a lot of your time going through the courses is spent on learning and exploration of topics with others at around the same time. Students can move faster or slower depending on circumstances, but you will always be in the same company as someone else going through something um, and learning at the, at the same time. Um, and so you can pair up and learn with each other. Content is given in a linear progression, thanks to the curriculum at Launch School. And there's this heavy focus on mastery-based learning, learning things super, super well before you move on to the next topic, which is excellent. Um, it was a game changer, I felt, in my worldview of if, how well I could learn things. Um, there's a lot of feedback, usually, in Launch School, with more if you seek it out. Um, you get feedback from working on projects or problems and um, posting in the forums or posting on Slack. Um, getting feedback on your assessments and your tests, really detailed feedback from the TAs, and um, also with you know new groups coming up like the spot and such. So there's an opportunity for a lot of feedback if you want it. Um, and then generally overall, for most students, there's basically a lack of experience in software before. So everyone is kind of coming in with fresh eyes and learning um, the content together. This is very different from when you start work at a professional job which is what I felt when I went to work at DigitalOcean. And at the time that I joined, and still to this day, DigitalOcean is mostly comprised of very, very senior engineers. Um, most of the members of my team have anywhere from 10 to 30 years of experience in software, which is crazy to me um, that some of them have been working on this stuff for 30 years. And so coming in, I'm suddenly the one who knows the least. And I also have a lot of people that I work with that are expecting me to complete things, but they kind of see things as a very obvious solution, whereas I'm still learning a lot. Um, this is just wanna, before I continue, I just wanna um, say that this is not the case of every company that you could start work at, but there are certainly a lot of companies where there is a lot of senior engineers. And if you come in, um, you'll be going through a lot of, wow, I don't know as much as I think I do, um, which is normal. So what I felt when I joined Dio was that I was playing catch up with my teammates, trying to catch up with their knowledge and their understanding of software. Um, the content that I was learning was very sporadic and prone to change. Whereas launch school, um, you have to complete a course and know it very, very well before you move on to the next course. At work, um, there's tight deadlines to finish projects. A project might use a specific technology and you have to work at a pace and know the technology well enough to finish the project but then you might move on to a new project that doesn't use it at all. So then you may not, it might not be worth spending more time learning it out of interest because you have to go learn something new. Um, this is pretty much characterized as just in time learning. Um, and there's a couple, I think there's an article by um, Chris about it, um, if anyone wants to check it out. And generally you have to work a bit harder to get feedback on what you're developing and such. It, it varies from company to company. Some companies, um, everyone gets their code reviewed by the members of their team before they you know, put it into production. Sometimes some places will just say, if you think it's good, you just go ahead and put it into production, which is a little wild to me. Um, but it's generally the, the consensus I've seen amongst uh, other Capstone grads is that you're not gonna get as much feedback as you would in launch school. So you have to go and ask for it. You have to go talk to your teammates and ask, can you give me feedback on this? How am I doing? What do you think about it? Which is a bit of a scary experience to kind of just constantly put yourself out there and asking for feedback from people with a lot more experience and they might point a lot of things out to you. Um, but overall, working in the industry, there's just going to be a lot of people around you with a lot of experience um, that you don't have. And so when I was working, while I've been working there, um, I noticed a couple of things about the senior engineers um, that I wanted to point out. What I noticed was that a lot of senior engineers could quickly debug issues, whether small or large systems, much faster than um, I would have expected. Um, they could design APIs and programs that handled edge cases as if they already knew the edge cases going in. Um, this, there's quite a bit of content at Launch School about how when you are solving a problem, you have to pause and consider edge cases for your solution and whether that'll break your solution. 
um, these engineers could code pro prototypes that were very close to the final solution that they actually chose and which worked very well. They didn't redo um, their solutions multiple, multiple, multiple times um, and much, much more. And these were things that I um, was very impressed by. And I would often ask them, you know, trying to grow and learn from them as well. How did you do that so fast? Or how did you know what to look out for? And they could explain their reasoning. They could give a whole list of their reasons, yes, no, um, as to why they took one path or another path to their solution or to solving a problem. But oftentimes, some of them would say, it felt like the right approach or idea, even when there was a bunch of trade-offs or caveats. They just had a feeling or an intuition. And the actual um, reasoning was that they had internalized their years of experience down to an intuition because so many of them had built so many programs, had coded so many prototypes and had debugged so many issues that over time that, uh, that those experiences and that knowledge had become something internalized that they didn't even need to think too much about. They kind of had a feeling or intuition of knowing where to go. And so this is actually leads to the topic I wanna to talk about. And that is that these sen senior engineers had built up a body of tacit knowledge. Um, I don't know if everyone here knows what tacit knowledge is, so I'm just kind of going to give um, a definition of it. And essentially, um, unlike explicit knowledge, which is knowledge that you learn by consuming content, like a blog post or a book, tacit knowledge is learned through experience and struggle over time. It can't be some. It can't be easily taught from one person to another. Someone could give you feedback, or someone could give you how they approached um, something, but it's. Uh, generally a type of knowledge that you build on your own path to an understanding of something. Um, there's examples all around us from our, from our lives. One of the first ones that we experience is riding a bike. Um, riding a bike is something that someone could explain to you um, from top down the mechanics of it, but it's something that you have to feel with your own body to actually feel comfortable riding that bike. It's all about your own body mechanics. Cooking is another area where there's tacit knowledge. Um, when you start off cooking, you're given a recipe, you're told to put all these ingredients together, cook for this long, and it should come out to this delicious plate of food. But oftentimes that's not the case. You have to adjust things. Um, one, uh, one cooktop does not cook as well or as fast as another cooktop. Um, there's certain reactions with food you need to be aware of. And it's all this information which over time as you cook more and more and more and do all kinds of different recipes, you come to just understand a couple things and can predict timing of when food is done or how to adjust things. Chess is a huge um, area where tacit knowledge is prevalent um, because in chess, when you're trying to improve, you're basically studying games, you're internalizing openings and games, lines of attack and defense, and you're playing games over and over and over again so that you can build in all of this knowledge so that when you're actually in a competition under a time crunch, you can play very effectively because you've done it so many times. And finally, editing or writing. Um, there's a lot of grammar rules and best practices and also like ways of writing. It's a very creative area, but there's also grammar rules. But if you work in uh, publishing um, or writing a lot, over time, you just get a feeling of, well, this sounds better or this writing is more clear. Um, and in software development, this idea of tacit knowledge is also there, where you internalize patterns for designing software, debugging approaches, and problem-solving strategies like PDAC at launch school, um, best practices, and so forth. And the key thing with tacit knowledge is that it's something that's built over time. Time is the magic ingredient for it. Um, it's all about mastering skills. And this is a quote here from Robert Greene from his excellent book, Mastery, where he talks about that um, if you practice over a period of time at a steady level, um, eventually certain elements of what you're learning become hardwired and that skill becomes internalized. And so then you don't actively think too much about what you're doing. And because of that, you can step back and look at the larger picture. I think of this as kind of like you're reducing your mental overhead. Once you've done hundreds of problems in Ruby for a certain type of problem, then you kind of know how it works so you can kind of step back and look at how you can solve it in different ways, um, as an example. Tacit knowledge is not something you can just pull from a book and immediately apply it. It has to be cultivated over time and practiced. 
Um, so why am I talking about it? Because a lot of, um, I'm assuming that quite a few of you here are kind of still core early into your careers. But the reason why I want to talk about it is so that you know about it, but also that you can um, shorten the time it takes to build tacit knowledge. Um, if you can recognize tacit knowledge when you see it, if you can um, have the right practices and processes in place and have the right mindset and you work on gathering feedback from people with more experience, you can effectively um, build your tacit knowledge quicker um, so you can be more, uh, more effective engineers sooner. So relevance to the core at launch school, um, how does this apply if I'm still learning fundamentals? Um, well, you can start learning and building test knowledge right now because it's going to compound over time as you advance in your studies and career. And for those of you listening who maybe have completed capstone, this is something that you're going to be doing in your career um, over time. So remember, test knowledge is something that's been heavily internalized. You don't think about it too much in the moment. And um, it's basically the more and more you try and build your tacit knowledge on a subject, then you're going to be able to reduce your mental overhead because you're not going to think too much about certain aspects you know very well, and you can focus on the points that give you discomfort or that you don't know that well. It makes it easier to focus on the things that are still difficult to you. So here's an example of launch school. Um, in the back end courses, you're learning a new language and how to program, whether it's Ruby or JavaScript. And at first, it's kind of overwhelming how much content there is to learn to write for your first programs. But over time, you internalize concepts. You're learning the language syntax. You're learning how functions work. You're learning variable scoping. You're learning pass by value versus pass by reference. And all these things that are there that um, in almost any program you write. And you, when you're learning it, you actively have to think about all that stuff. But as you write more and more programs, as you solve more and more problems in that language, then you don't actively have to think about the syntax. You're just writing the code. You know how a function works and you can recognize variable scoping um, when you see it rather than actually looking at the whole code and in your mind trying to trace the scoping um, visually. So after solving a bunch of problems and writing a bunch of code, you start to not even think about some of the stuff that you used to have to think about because you've done it so much. And the more that you've internalized, the easier and quicker it is to solve quiz and assessment questions because you've already seen a problem so many times. Um, so let's say like you're preparing for an assessment and the assessments at launch school are typically a test and then also a coding interview or a project that you have to build. build. Um, for the test, you do have to review explicit knowledge. You have to review all the concepts that you learned from the lessons and all of the example code that was given. Um, and that's great because you can utilize a whole slew of strategies to learn that stuff. But when you're coming to the coding interview or project, you can read about a problem solving strategy like PDAC hundred times, but it's only going to sink in so that's natural when you've done it so many times. So actually to excel at these uh, interviews and projects, you want to work through many problems and you want to practice writing a lot of programs to build that tacit knowledge. And you kind of want to keep doing that until certain parts of it feel automatic. And you, and you essentially, when you get to the interview and you're asked to solve a problem, you're already starting the PDAC process. You're already um, have kind of an idea of how to structure your code. You're not fumbling over syntax or <clears throat> basic concepts. You're just focusing on what the problem is asking you and your approach to it. Um, so when you're practicing, you're getting to the point where the process feels a bit automatic, but don't try and memorize. You want to solve a lot of problems so that the process is easy to you, but you don't want to memorize how those problems are solved exactly. Um, as a more advanced example, here's something that happened in my work shortly after I joined DigitalOcean. Um, my team was tasked with building a completely new service in the system, um, and it was going to take over the responsibilities of managing IP addresses from every other service. Um, at the time, other services in the system talked to the database about IPs, but we wanted to move all of that to just one service that we owned. Um, and so we had to do that. That service we write has to talk to our database. That service is going to be involved in the creation and deletion of our company's primary product, which are um, called droplets or virtual private servers. You don't really need to know what that is, but it's the thing that makes money for my company, for the company. Um, so it's extremely important. 
and the service was going to be called by a lot of other services in the system. So at a high level, the challenges involved were, we're going to build this new service from the ground up. It's going to have this public API that other systems will call. It's going to handle connections with a database that is heavily used. Uh, we have to move all these other services to talk to us instead of the database. And we have to write a lot of new code. Um, probably, uh, I, I don't even give a line of count, I don't know. Um, and we also have to keep the service up and running during peak customer traffic. So when there's just so many customers who want to use our product, we don't want that to be the time that we go down because it's going to be really bad for us. And so when we got this project, what did the senior engineers on my team focus the most on? Well, I had my ideas. I thought it was going to be all the code that we had to write or the design of the API. But in fact, they spend most of the time focusing on the process of moving other services to use our service and making sure we stayed up and running during peak customer traffic. And I asked them, you know, why did you focus on that? It seems to me like we have all this code to write and all this stuff to design. It seemed pretty difficult how hard it could it be to um, get other teams to use our service. And they actually said that the code was not the hard part because they had written hundreds of services and APIs in their careers. Remember, some of them had been working 10 to 30 years as uh, engineers. Um, so they knew how to approach all this stuff. It had been internalized. Um, but moving other services to use our service required a lot of research, discussions with the teams, discovering assumptions and edge cases, and having the service um, operate well under a lot of traffic so that we didn't cause an outage is a big priority and it can be a very tricky problem. So the end result was that they had internalized a lot of patterns for writing code for this problem and the API to design that they didn't really need to think too much about it. They looked at it and they said, this is not going to be too difficult. These other problems are more difficult based on their experience. And once again, they were saying some things like it felt like the right thing to do. It was an obvious priority. I knew this from experience. That's their tacit knowledge at work. So now we've covered what tacit knowledge is. Um, now I want to give some kind of principles that I've kind of come across and also thought for myself that are useful for building your tacit knowledge. Um, we're going to go through each of these. They're going to get their own slide. Just want to put this here for anyone just to get a quick glance um, of them. So the first one is that you want to build your knowledge in layers. Um, when you're learning something new that will require a lot of time, um, you have to break it down into steps and then tackle them one by one. And then as you internalize each step, it'll make the next step easier to learn. So kind of the visualization that I have is that you're building a wall of knowledge and you want to start from the bottom and go up. You can't jump um, two feet into the air and start there because there's nothing for it to, to, to be resting on that's stable. Um, so if you're learning a new language, an example of this is that, okay, you just joined your new uh, company um, or you got to the front end portion of the Launch School core, you have to learn a new language. Um, what do you do? Well, the very base level is that you have to pick up the new syntax. Um, and for that, you can start by just writing some very small programs, literally smaller than you think you want, just so you can get a feel for the syntax and practice it so that you don't have to think too much about it. And then you also get to practice the write, execute, and debug cycle for your programs. It's much easier to get that process um, down, path, with small things that don't have a lot going on. And so then you build that until it feels natural for the language, and then you work on increasingly bigger programs until you're making whole projects that maybe you're using multiple files and have a lot going on. Um, and then once you're kind of at that point, you can start using some advanced features of the language one at a time. Um, for the case of JavaScript, you can think of asynchronous code, closures, um, different kinds of object-oriented approaches. So basically, once you have a feel for the basics of the language, it's much easier to then just focus on the more advanced stuff you have to learn. An example of this um, in the realm of martial arts um, was given by the author of this book called Art of Learning. Um, and it's an excellent book about tacit knowledge. I would highly recommend you all check it out. It's a very light read. Um, but the author is a national chess and martial arts champion. And he details his process for how he would just improve a single movement in martial arts, um, like his punch. And he says that he incrementally um, refined the simplest movements piece by piece, soaking in the principles until he moved without thinking. The most common error in the learning of martial arts, he says, 
is taking too much on at once. Um, so that's kind of what we're talking about when I'm saying building your knowledge in layers. You want to go from the ground up, get all that basic stuff down, so then you can move on to the next stuff, repeat and get that down right, and you can move on from there. The entire book um, basically explores the author's experience building tacit knowledge in chess and martial arts, and I felt like there was a lot of correlations to programming. Um, an example would be like, we're going to get into, which is breaking projects down into small manageable pieces. And so if you want to kind of like use this process um, for building a backend program and you want to kind of work through um, building that program and um, going through all the um, things involved, an example here would be like, we have a backend program that takes some input, it stores that input in a database and it retrieves that data for the user. And this simple little uh, program involves a couple um, steps along the way, like designing an API database operations, the queries you have to write to access the, da the database. What is your schema design for the database going to be? Um, so basically all the tables in the database and how they um, relate to each other. The tests you're going to write, local development and deployment. Um, like you've got the program running, it's working fine in your machine. Next step is to deploy it somewhere where anyone on the internet could maybe access it if that's what you want to do. Um, so even in just this small program, there's different things that you can challenge yourself on to build knowledge over time, building how um, your knowledge of building APIs or the um, correct way to uh, build uh, a schema for a database or practice writing tests. And the, the, what you want to do taking um, this uh, approach of small steps at a time is that um, you break each of these goals into small steps and you don't get derailed. Um, you want to try and complete each one even if it's a little dirty, like it's uh, not the cleanest, but you want to keep moving until you finish the project. And then you can circle back with more challenges, like making the code simpler, trying different abstractions or using advanced concepts. Um, next thing I want to, um, next uh, kind of uh, practice is basically embracing the struggle. Um, building tacit knowledge requires a lot of time, effort and feedback. Um, you have to trust the process and enjoy each step along the way. Um, getting to be really, really good at designing code or using the right abstractions or um, debugging complex systems is going to take some time. Um, so you have to just kind of get ready for that. And Launch School does a pretty good job of having us trust a process. Um, remember that it's not going to be a fast route, but trying to get this experience in and getting used to creating your own processes for learning this kind of stuff is going to be a big differentiator between you and other engineers. Um, you want to remember that you will not always succeed as you attempt to build hard projects or tackle new challenges. So do your best to view these moments as opportunities for growth. Um, a small to moderate amount of discomfort when you're doing this kind of stuff, when you're practicing something new or you're building this knowledge, actually means you're pushing your limits. And that's a good thing. You wanna kind of have just a little bit of discomfort so that you know that you're growing. But if there's too much or you don't even know how to proceed, that's a sign for you to step back, break things down to smaller pieces and go from there. Um, an example of kind of embracing the struggle for me at my work was, um, I did not know how to debug issues in a large distributed system. Um, it's something that I found very tricky um, simply because I didn't know the system that well. And one of the ways that I kind of embraced that struggle was that I always offered to take um, time to be on call to answer the pager when the system goes down. Um, even, like when my teammates like, you know, want to shift schedules or they're going on vacation and they need someone to cover for them, I would take that chance to step up because while it is a little scary to be in that situation, I knew that the more times that I was in that situation and had to debug issues, the better I would become over time. Um, seeking out challenges, um, building things that are just um, slightly harder than used to is the goal. Once something's easy, you have, should increase difficulty and retain a sense of discomfort. Um, and so um, you can do this either by going to find a new project that you want to go do and you want to practice um, and build that knowledge, um, or you can take an existing project you have and introduce new challenges. Um, for example, with the backend project I just gave, um, you know, once you get to a point where the code just works, you can go back and ask yourself, how can I make this code cleaner? How can I make this code simpler? So that you can build over time that intuition of what is clean code, 
what is simple code to you. Um, you can also attempt to write things in a different approach, um, maybe doing an object-oriented approach if you didn't before. Um, you can then also practice like using some more advanced features of the language that others say would be better to use. Um, so with JavaScript, one thing that comes up is uh, closures. Closures as an idea are in many languages. I'm just using JavaScript because it's in launch school. Um, but there's um, kind of this intuition of, should I write a new function or should I use a closure instead? And that's something that's kind of, you build an understanding of over time. And so once you have a project that works and it's fine, now you can kind of go back and fiddle with one of these uh, challenges. Um, but it can be hard to come up with project ideas. Um, and to, do, to kind of get around that, feel free to ask others for project ideas or challenges they're kind of going through. Ask fellow students, your coworkers at your job, any mentors you have. Um, one of the things I do is that if I want to work on a specific skill, I'll go find a tutorial on a project that uses that skill. And then I will do that tutorial. And then I will go from there. I will then add some challenges to it or um, work on um, making it simpler and stuff. So it's okay to um, not be overflowing with ideas. Feel free to go out and grab another idea. Um, train yourself to spot explicit versus tacit knowledge. Because um, if you can spot it, then you can know how you need to approach it to learn it. Um, and so whenever you're learning something new, you should take a second to kind of look at it and see which knowledge you're going to be dealing with. Um, an example that I use is Docker. Um, Docker is a technology that isn't covered in launch school, but it's very widely used in the industry. Um, it's not a terribly hard uh, technology to use, um, and it's used for deploying your applications. Um, and I'm not going to cover what Docker is, but I'm just going to talk about a couple ways I could look at it to see which is explicit or tacit knowledge. So with Docker, there's commands to learn, there's documentation to read and um, learn from, and that's explicit knowledge. That's something that you can read, you can take notes on, you can put into flashcards, um, you can remember it. But if you forget something, you can go just look it up. Um, how to build and deploy apps using Docker. Um, that's a mix of explicit and tacit because you can read about how you can do that, but, some, but you also need to start practicing it so that you can not have to think too much about that. Um, challenges of using Docker, that's also a mixture because there'll be lots of blog posts and people's experiences about you know, challenges of using Docker, but you also should be using Docker and practicing with it so that you can just get a feel for the challenges um, and kind of so you can predict them. Um, and then debugging issues. Debugging as a whole is just one of those areas that it's not easy to teach another person. You just have to go through that process um, repeatedly. Um, and in, with any technology, the more you do it, the more you'll remember solutions or things to look out for. So if you ask yourself, how can I build my tacit knowledge of Docker? Just build a lot of applications using it. Start small with like a Hello World app and just start using Docker as much as possible and just get those reps in. Um, Frequently ask for feedback. Uh, targeted feb feedback is really helpful for seeing improvements you may have missed. Um, and ask people with more experience so they can point out issues or areas for improvement that you may have missed. Um, this whole process of building this knowledge, you can do on your own. You can always reflect on what you did and what could be fixed, but it's really helpful to get an outside perspective. Um, and this can come in many forms. If you're in launch school, you can ask more advanced students in the core that maybe you've built a relationship with. Um, I have not um, hung out around the channel for the spot a lot, but I, what I've heard um, is that you can go there and get some feedback if you need it. Um, so I recommend you check it out. Um, if you're working as a dev, you can reach out to senior developers in your team to get their feedback. Um, and if there's any mentorship programs or relationships that you have with other developers, that's also a really great um, avenue to get some feedback. And I just wanna pause here and say that it's always gonna feel a little scary to ask for feedback because um, it's basically exposing your lack of knowledge on something or lack of experience. Um, but there's no other way that you're going to improve in this aspect. Um, by not asking for feedback, you're missing out on a lot of um, improvement from others. Um, so just try your best to adopt a growth mindset, thinking you can always improve and you will improve over time. And in fact, people generally love being asked for their feedback and thoughts. So while it feels a little uncomfortable, you usually will get some, um, a good reception back. Um, 
Next is prioritize building content. And this is something that I struggled with a lot, um, both in college and also going through launch school. Um, I am someone who loves to read and who loves to think that just reading content means that I know something. Um, I will go through whole books on subjects and then thinking that, okay, I know it. So when it comes to the exam, I can just solve the problems. That's not how things work typically. Um, what you need to do is you actually need to go through that process of actually um, struggling with problems, projects and such. Um, during core, your main focus is often learning explicit knowledge through the reading lessons, walking through programs and projects. And this is excellent for building a foundation. Um, and there's whole strategies that students have talked about, given tech talks about. Um, Anki as spaced repetition with flashcards is great for remembering explicit, con explicit knowledge. But at the end of the day, if you forget something, you can still go look it up. Um, but <laughs> tacit knowledge is something that um, you can only gain through just building something. Um, at certain points in the core and in your career, you just got to put the books down and design and build programs um, and actually exercise the explicit knowledge that you have in your head um, and actually working through the obstacles of that project. Um, and when you are trying to take on building something, um, you want to make sure that you always set manageable goals and just keep shipping. Um, so in the back end program example that I gave, you have all these steps. You might be building like the public API and you get it done. And then you say to yourself, wow, this is done. I bet I can make it a lot cleaner. I would actually advise that you don't. You just move on to the next thing, to the next task until the whole thing is done and you have something up and running so that then you can then circle back. Um, so always just keep moving forward. There's a really good example of this, um, this step of building rather than um, you know, choosing not to build that comes from the world of art. Um, there's this book called Art and Fear, um, which details the processes of creating art. And it tells the story of a ceramics teacher that basically split students into two groups. And the one group um, was told that they'll be graded on a single ceramics pot that they create. They can spend the entire semester just learning about art, um, drawing the pot, and um, basically thinking about how they'll do it. And then they'll just build it once, and then that's the thing they'll be graded on. And then the other group could make as many pots as they wish. And then at the end of the semester, they'll be graded on those pots based on like how good each pot was. Um, and basically what was found by a teacher was that the students who got a chance to make all these different pots, even though the first ones were not that good, near the end of the class of the semester, they were making the highest quality pots. And that was because they kept actually making something then reflecting and seeing what was bad, what was difficult and improving on the next one and repeat and repeat and repeat. This group that actually only had to make a single pot but could spend the whole semester just um, thinking about how they could make it, studying art and kind of doing all of this like um, consuming of content rather than building content, they actually had the worst pot. So this is just kind of a nice anecdote I found um, in the world of art on why you should prioritize building. Now, um, the next step I wanted to talk about is evaluating your knowledge. As with any learning, you need to constantly check your understanding of something um, and consider what's easy or difficult for a topic you're learning. Um, this is, I guess this might be in the realm of metacognition, I'm not too sure, but it's basically thinking about how you understand something. Um, and so you wanna just, um, when you're going through a topic, you wanna kind of um, decide what's easy, what's hard, and focus on the hard stuff. And so then you can pinpoint the things you need to um, improve on that feel like you have some discomfort with. Um, and this is a great way to help develop a strategy for practicing those pieces. And then each time you um, complete something, you want to look back on it and um, make slight adjust adjustments for the next time. Um, the whole process of just evaluating how well you knew something and um, what you can improve on is really, really valuable. Um, reflect on your learnings. Um, building tacit knowledge requires experience and reflection. You want to keep taking note on what you struggle with because it will inform what you do in your next practice session. Um, 
and you want to jot down any processes that helped you and could be used in other sessions or in learning different topics. Um, and the example of when I said that I was embracing struggle by always being on call for when the system goes down. Um, anytime something occurred that I didn't know how to fix and then somebody showed me how to fix it or I figured out a way to fix it, I would always um, jot it down somewhere so that I could look back on it the next time something bad happened. Um, so I could just create a process of elimination or know how things related so that I could debug things easier. So um, always reflect on when you've completed a project, what was difficult, what you could do better. Um, if you get feedback from anyone, record that feedback so you can get um, to use it later. And then personally, I find journaling really helpful for this aspect. Um, it's really helpful for me to just write out um, how something went for like a practice project or a problem so that I can reflect on it and use it next time. And um, coming up to the end here, I've just got two more slides. Um, the helpful processes that I have for um, improving tacit knowledge are uh, these three that I wanted to point out. Um, it's good for when you're learning a new language or new, new technology to have a set of problems to use when you're learning it, because then over time you will just know how to solve maybe that problem or the general approach to build that project so that then you can just focus on the new language syntax and features. Um, that's just a, another way of being able to do something so that you're focused on the things that you are uncomfortable with. Um, so Launch School has all those practice problems from the back end courses. They're great to take if you want to go learn a new language like Go or Rust or something, um, because then you've already solved them and you can just kind of do them in the new language. Um, set aside your learning during hours of deep work if you can. Um, deep work is a really valuable concept um, and it was introduced by Cal Newport and the link here in the underline um, is to his book. And basically deep work is um, periods of time where you're doing really focused work without distractions. So there's no multitasking. You don't have a bunch of things going on at the same time. Um, you may not even have any music on if it distracts you. It's basically you're just zeroed in on what you're doing so that you can be focused and be all in um, and make sure that you're more aware of what you're doing. Um, and then lastly is deliberate practice. Um, deliberate practice is kind of, you can think of it as like a cycle in that you are setting a goal that is achievable, and requires effort, with a little bit of difficulty, and then you aim to complete it in a set period of time. And then you do that. And then when the timer is up, you stop and you reflect on the work you've done. Um, this is really helpful just to have a feedback loop um, and to give you an idea of just like where you are um, in this topic. So if the time you set was too short and you didn't finish it in time, then you can look back and see what you struggled with so you can improve that piece. Um, so utilizing deliberate work has been really, really, deliberate practice has been really helpful. Um, and if possible, if you've completed something, getting feedback from someone is um, always important. And just closing out here with some resources um, that I have here if you want to learn more about tacit knowledge. There's a blog series, a couple relating to programming. Um, then there's the two books I've quoted here from The Art of Learning and Mastery. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm ready to take questions now. Thanks everyone for sticking around who did and listening. I know this topic is a little bit vague or there's a lot of anecdotes and such, but um, hopefully there's been things here you can take away. Um, and if not, happy to answer any questions. Awesome, thank you so much for your presentation. And yeah, we'll hop into Q&A now. So you can either raise your hand and then I'll toggle speaking on for you, or you can drop your questions into the Q&A field down at the bottom. All right, we have a question from Lena. Thank you for sharing your tacit knowledge with us, Julius. You mentioned to seek out challenges and ask others for project ideas. I'd like to ask you, what are some of the more enjoyable projects you've taken on for learning? Or what project ideas do you have 
for the back end and front end portions of the LS courses. Yeah, um, <clears throat> thanks Leanne for the question. Um, let me think about that. So I will say that when I was working through um, the law school courses, um, I didn't know about tacit knowledge or um, I was still struggling with the idea of um, building all the time because I was still very much um, focused on just like consuming the content and learning it. So always taking notes, reflecting on those notes, uh, flashcards was huge for me. So I actually didn't do as many projects during the curriculum as others did. And I really wish that I had. Um, I feel like it would have made me a much stronger capstone student, much stronger engineer when I started uh, my job. Um, there's not a lot, I think, on the top of my head that I can say is like, this is the perfect project for this part place in the curriculum. Um, but I think that if you finish a course in the curriculum, it's and you are able to like in your time frame, um, if you're not in a rush to get to the next course or the capstone, is to take a little time and try and build a project that focuses on just those concepts. Um, I think that when you finish, let's say, I think it's 180, 185, which is the database courses, it's really, really good to build a project that you can then practice all that database knowledge. Um, one thing that I did do was create like an expense application with Ruby where um, it had Ruby and it used uh, Postgres. And it was basically allowing me to enter expenses that I had done, um, retrieve expenses that I had for a certain month or a certain week. And then I could also get like um, some kind of like total for the month. So that was just kind of like a really nice small project to just practice that stuff. Um, for the front end courses, especially for when you get to 230, when you're mixing JavaScript and HTML um, and creating kind of dynamic websites, um, there was a really good um, series. I think it was JS30. Um, I'll have to go look it up, but basically um, it's, a, it's a 30 small projects with JS and HTML, CSS that you can do that all focused on one or two things. And it was really, really helpful to cement each of the little concepts that I had from uh, the front end courses. Um, so I'll, I'll look that one up and I'll post it in Slack um, so you can, uh, you can check it out. Um, as for some of the more enjoyable projects, um, I have done a lot of uh, Go applications involving MySQL um, for my work at DigitalOcean. Um, I've, <laughs> Trying to remember a couple more. Um, let's see. I'll look up some of the ones I've done. Um, but yeah, uh, I would say if you are struggling to find any, it's good to look up a good tutorial and then go from there. Um, but if any more come to mind, I will post in Slack. Uh, I see there's a bunch more questions. Well, let's move to the next question from Rebecca. During the core curriculum, would you recommend completing open source projects via GitHub? That's a good question. I feel like I would not fully recommend that. Um, simply because open source projects, there's a lot that you kind of have to know, I feel with like as a working engineer. Um, to put up a lot of open source pull requests. Um, a lot of open source projects require that you've not only presented sometimes like a design um, and the solution, but you also have done some kind of testing as well um, due to the way they do the testing. Um, some projects rely on performance. And so you need to know how to do performance testing to show that your changes don't impair how well the project functions. Um, there's a whole range of uh, projects I think that could be good for a launch school student to, to check out maybe. Um, projects that are more like a library um, or, um, yeah, I think libraries would be a good pick. But if I had to actually choose how to spend your time, I would really say that you want to focus on something that's completely in your control, um, something that's targeting what you are focusing on in your learning, um, because 
you can kind of control how fast you move on that. Um, sometimes it can take quite a while to get anything done on open source. Some projects, the con contributors, the maintainers are very quick to respond. I've also seen some open source requests that can take several, several months to be actually done and merged. So it is definitely a bit of a slower pace. Um, I think open source is a great thing to get into once you're done with launch school. But I typically, if you're going through the core, I would really recommend that you focus most of your efforts on the core itself. You can always expand more with more practice projects, talking with other students, um, and that kind of stuff. Awesome. That was really useful to hear. Um, the next question is from Joey. Did you use Anki for your flash core? flashcards, what was your method for creating flashcards from course content? Yeah, I used Anki a lot and I still use Anki for the things that I'm learning um, at work and outside of work. Um, Anki, I feel like, is one of the best tools for retaining explicit knowledge and retaining important uh, things regarding the technologies you use or once you have um, certain kind of approaches to solving problems that can be generalized. Um, and for that, I would really recommend, and this is all gonna be very personal. It's really just kind of like what I, what works for me, um, it may not work for you, but I would recommend that you keep the cards as small in content as possible. Basically just it's asking one thing and you're giving one answer. Um, if you can break a single Anki card into four or five smaller, simpler Anki cards, then that's preferable, in my opinion. Because um, you want them to be something you can quickly review. Um, you don't want to be remembering whole paragraphs or an Anki card. Um, I like keeping all my cards in a single deck. So that means I just work through that deck. I don't have to remember to hop between decks to remember everything. So I just have one deck called everything, which has everything in the different languages I learn, the um, different technologies I learn. I have things for non-software things like cooking and other uh, random bits of content that I run and remember. Um, so keeping everything together, trying to make them as small as possible um, has been really helpful for me. I think there was another talk this, during this week that touched on Enki, and there's also a blog post or two that I can post that are um, really useful for how you use Enki effectively. Awesome, thanks. And if anyone wants to check out that other webinar, it was Mandy's presentation, and the link is available in the Launch School Forum now. And so let's jump to the next question. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Very interesting and useful. How do you deal with non-constructive feedback? Do you have some experience about it or any examples? I think it can be very hard and discouraging for some people. That's a really good question. Um, and you know, the truth is that sometimes you will get some non-constructive feedback. Um, or some feedback that might be constructive, but is conveyed in such a way that it sounds, sounds antagonistic, um, or it sounds, at least the way you hear it in your head, that it's uh, deprecating to you. Um, some of the, sometimes that's just a case of tone or communicating online, which is very difficult. Um, there was an, actually an engineer on my team who was extremely good at software engineering, had so much knowledge, um, had a lot of strong opinions, and he was very direct when he would comment on your code um, to the point where the way that I took his feedback, it sounded like basically a little bit like he was belittling kind of the work I was doing. Um, but whenever I would chat with him in person, he was completely um, a wonder, like a really nice person to talk to. Um, and so what I realized was for his case, it was a matter of how he communicated online and his tone and how it's very hard to give a certain tone when you're just like messaging on Slack or posting a comment on GitHub. So sometimes you do have to try to see if the comment is actually non-constructive or if it's just the way that you're reading it. Um, and you have to kind of work through that as well. But if the criticism is entirely not constructive, then my best advice in that case is to completely just ignore it and go find feedback from someone you know will give you good feedback. Um, and I know that kind of sounds like 
a little bit dodgy, but the fact is, is that if someone's not going to take the time to give you something that's useful to you and that's helpful to you, then that's not really an avenue that you should try to go down to. Um, you should try and get feedback from people who want to help you and try and brush off the non-constructive feedback um, in that case. And I hope that's helpful, but if you, if you have any kind of clarifying point or have an example you want to give me um, after the presentation, happy to have a direct message and we can talk about it. But um, yeah, generally it, it can be a bit, a bit of a struggle, but um, there are more people out there who will try and help you if you find them than people who will want to try and put you down, in my experience. Thank you for sharing about that. And then just another plug on the talk coming tomorrow. Kelly will be talking about communication and how you can kind of uh, handle some of these situations that you might encounter in the workplace too. And then let's jump into the next question from Austin. Inspiring talk as a student in JS210 who loves LS and the learning process. I wonder about the two potential worlds depending on these paths. What might your life be like if you hadn't done capstone, but instead searched for work after the core program? Do you think you may have still been able to participate in such meaningful, challenging work? It's a good question. Um, so I, I knew that I wanted to do capstone pretty early on. Um, it was always a goal of mine um, for many reasons. Um, but if we had to kind of like, to an alternate path and um, if I hadn't done capstone. Um, I think I have absolute confidence that I would have found a job at, at a certain point. Um, and it would have been most likely like a good job. Um, I would have been able to still show like that I am a very strong um, programmer, that I have a great growth mindset and that I can learn all kinds of technologies. Um, I don't think that I would have been wanting for a job um, as a, like a baseline response. Um, I do think that um, Capstone as a program and the projects that come out of it allow you to break into different kinds of companies and jobs based on the challenges there that would be more difficult if I was just a core student who didn't do some kind of project like that. Um, it would just be um, more likely that I would get a job at a company that um, worked at a smaller scale. So didn't have millions of customers um, or have um, like all the challenges that DigitalOcean has. Um, but it would be a kind of like different challenges. Um, I would do think that I would have been able to find meaningful and challenging work. Um, but I think there might have been also a bit of a longer runway to get there. It might have been that I joined a company um, that was just a little challenging um, than what I was used to with launch school. And then I could hop to another company that was like an upgrade and so forth. The benefit that I felt like I got from Capstone was that um, I got to front load a few months of um, learning all about these challenging software um, problems and like how to do work with large scale systems that meant that I could start working at DigitalOcean, which had a lot of more difficult uh, challenges from the get-go. Um, so I feel like in a way it was kind of like a, I fast-tracked a little bit, if that makes sense. Um, there are several students um, at launch school who finished core, who did not do capstone, who did their own project that um, was pretty intensive and then landed at a great job that I think is giving them really meaningful work. Um, but that is, that does require a lot more from you individually. You have to really put a lot more of your work in um, whereas at Capstone, you have kind of like a community of other students um, and you have the instructors to help you out. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a bunch of trade-offs. Um, I still think that I would have been successful with core, um, just not where I am right now. Um, so yeah, that's my response. Awesome, great question and answer. So we are down to the final three questions. The next one is, have you heard of exorcism.io? And there's a comment, it's useful for picking up new languages while learning how to write in that language's idiomatic way with mentoring and feedback. I have heard of exorcism and I've actually used it um, quite a bit. I've used it for um, solving problems with Ruby, 
um, with C and I'm probably going to start using it for, oh, I also did a few of them in Go and I'm probably going to use it also for Rust in the coming months. Um, and I do like exorcism.io. Um, it's a really great website, really good problems. Um, and I really like the, the mentors who work there, or I guess who donate their time and will give you responses. Um, the one of the challenging things that I did find about it was that depending on the mentor you got for the problem you solved, sometimes the solutions they would try and suggest to you or that they would have you kind of like explore was just a few levels higher than maybe your current skill level. Um, and so if that's the case, it can sometimes feel like you solve the problem. There's a much more like elegant or um, uh, more clean way to do it that involves some advanced language features that at the time I was not quite like there to use yet. Um, so that can, that kind of was like one of the things I noticed. I do think that it's excellent for um, once you have the basic syntax of language down and once you have the basic uh, concepts down and you've written a few small programs, it's really good to then go there because you get that feedback. Um, just something to be aware of is sometimes the mentor will be just a few levels above you and then you're kind of like, okay, like I'm still going to stick with my answer because it's the answer I understand and I'll circle back on that later. Um, so yeah, that's, it's, it's a good website. Cool. And our next question is, is there any way to memorize high level functions and methods faster? So I'm guessing this is high level functions and methods for a language, like in the documentation. Um, if that's the case, um, memorize them faster. I mean, you could always um, put that, that function or method into a flash current like Anki, which I just my go to, um, and then just make sure that you um, refresh and learn it um, often. Um, I don't know if you've used Anki before, but Anki has this uh, mechanism for where if you've answered a flash card, you can rate how difficult it is. And if it was more difficult, then it will reappear sooner. And then you can look at it again and refresh yourself. If you remember it very easily, it'll kick it off to a week, a month or longer away so that it comes back right when you're about to forget and that'll uh, cement it in your brain. Um, I guess another way to memorize it, it's not really memorized, but um, if you practice problems and explicitly use that function um, as much as you can, it will be one of the first ones in your mind that you will reach to when you see that problem again. Um, so if you really want to practice a certain function or method from a language, um, you could do that. I don't know how much like benefit that will give you. Um, so I would say that if you do want to just memorize something, Anki would be my go-to. Awesome. And then we are on the final question from Mandy. Hi, Julius. Great presentation. Since explicit knowledge can be evaluated through testing or assessment at LS, how would you evaluate if you're improving on your tacit knowledge as a student or working developer? Gotcha. This is maybe something that I could have um, done a better job of uh, of making clear in my presentation. Um, so I think one of the key things with improving your tacit knowledge is, um, first of all, getting feedback from people who are more experienced than you. Um, that's one avenue, um, because once someone with more experience than you basically starts agreeing with your solution or your approach, um, you know that you kind of are reaching that level that they're at. Um, but I think that personally for me, um, Tacit knowledge is, is more about me checking in with myself about how well I know what I'm working on. Um, let me see if I can try and give an example. Um, so one thing that I've been trying to work on with um, my current projects at work has been how do I design um, APIs for a new service. And depending on the uh, problem we're trying to solve, 
there's one design that's going to be a better fit than the other one. Um, now, I don't know of the designs out there in the world, um, but uh, I will generally like try a first stab at my design um, and get it down, get um, kind of like all my thoughts on it, the pros and cons. Um, and then um, I will like one avenue is to go and talk to like my tech lead on my team and say, hey, this is my approach for solving this. What do you think? And then they'll say, oh, that design is not right for X, Y, Z reasons, or you're close. Um, or I could compare it to um, one of the um, books on API design. Um, there's a good, really good book from Manning called uh, API Design Patterns. There's also, um, I think, Domain Driven Design is a really good book, but it's a bit advanced. Um, but I think one thing is like, as I said, like checking with myself is like, when I am practicing something involving tacit knowledge, I try and just keep gauging how comfortable I am while I'm doing it. Um, usually I have like a notepad next to me and I keep jotting down um, like when I get stuck on something or when I'm trying to waffle between one or two approaches um, or if I just flat out don't know how to do something. Um, and I'll go through that problem, that project. And then um, I'll kind of like take note of the things that were there that was challenging for me. Um, and then I'll, you know, wait for some time, um, give myself some time so that I forget exactly how I maybe tackled that problem or that small project. And then um, at some point I'll decide, let me try that again. Um, and then I'll see whether I make those same mistakes or whether there's still some things I waffle on. Um, so that's where for me journaling, keeping notes um, really helps because then I can kind of circle back and see like, oh, like I really struggled with choosing one of these two approaches to design uh, like this uh, database operation or um, this way of accepting your user's input. This time I immediately reached for this one because it seemed like it was the better fit. Um, it's a little hard to kind of give like an explicit, this is how I know I'm doing well. Um, for me, I feel like a lot of it is just like, um, how much am I stalling on solving this? Uh, how much discomfort am I feeling? Um, am I completely flat out, have no idea? That's basically my general indicators um, because I'm trying to build up that intuition. I'm trying to build up that internal, like um, how I proceed with things. Um, if I actively have to really think and struggle with it, then that's a sign that it's not internalized yet. I hope, I hope that makes sense. Um, like I said, like I feel like from what I've read and discussed with other engineers, this whole topic of tacit knowledge is very personal. Um, and it's something that is very difficult to just tell someone, this is how you would do it. You really have to kind of go on that journey yourself and see how you can tell when you know something. Thank you for sharing. And then that actually does it for Q&A now. I will hand it back to you for any closing remarks and then Alfonso will wrap up the session today. And awesome. thank you again, Julius. Oh, no problem. Um, thanks for reaching out to me to talk. Um, well, I wanna thank everyone for coming out and listening. Um, at times I felt like maybe this talk was in a bit of a rough shape or um, there was a couple of things that would be just like a little bit hard to convey. Um, but I do feel like this is a very important topic as we grow in our careers as engineers um, and try and take on more challenging work. Um, I guess closing remarks are, um, you're going to face a lot of challenges when you start working your first professional job and so forth. There are gonna be times where you might feel a lot of imposter syndrome. Um, there's gonna be a lot of times where maybe you feel like even after all of launch school, you still don't know enough and you still struggle with uh, feeling like you are there as an engineer. But I want to absolutely say that you are, you've worked very hard and you are an engineer. It's just that you have crossed the first pond of software engineering, which is launch school. And then you're about to encounter the ocean, which is the industry and everything involved. And it does get easier over time. Um, and um, I can already see that after just after two years, I'm much better at some of the things I've done and I know things more than I did before. Um, so it is, it will happen to you eventually too. 
Um, and if you ever, you know, have questions or want to talk more about this, um, bounce any kind of ideas for improving tacit knowledge, feel free to reach out to me. We'd love to talk more about it. Um, I will try my best to always be around this community. And that's all I've got. Thanks for coming. All right. Well, with that, we're going to wrap this seminar up. Uh, thank you, Julius, for such an insightful and helpful presentation and for bringing up these important intuitions and, and especially for your time. I just want to mention that our presenters and organizers have worked very hard to put this week of seminars together. So to all involved, thank you for continuing your work to build our community and spread the joy of learning. And to all our wonderful studios participants, thank you for attending today and supporting the pursuit of higher level learning. The social network frequently hosts student run events. So if you haven't already stopped by the social network channel on Slack to step to stay in the loop and drop us a line to let us know what you've learned from the seminars. Thanks you. Thank you very much and have a great rest of your day.